Great to be back with you guys this morning, and uh, I hope everyone has their coffee on this nice, crispy fall morning. Uh, if you don't, then I will pray for you. I'm just kidding. Um, so <clears throat> what I'd like to do is sort of um, review some things that we went over. We've been, it's been a couple of months uh, since I've been with you guys, and uh, what I'd like to do is a little bit of a review from last time. Um, I want to begin with a quote from uh, a an archaeologist uh, that's here locally in the area, uh, Dr. James Hoffmeyer. And uh, Hoffmeyer said this in his book, uh, Israel in, uh, in Egypt, uh, published by Oxford University Press. He said, the exodus and conquest stand or fall together. So if we're looking for archaeological evidence for the exodus, then we're also going to see the ex evidence for the conquest. So uh, whether or not you agree or disagree with Hoffmeyer and some of his uh, uh, observations about the exodus, he is absolutely right about that, and that's something that uh, I have kept in mind since I read it. In fact, I actually thought that before I read it, and I thought, oh, he's just confirming what I said, so Dr. Hoffmeyer was agreeing with me. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, but he's, uh, he's absolutely right. Uh, this really surfaces a really important issue in the Old Testament archaeology, um, and it's the issue of chronology, the issue of when did the events happen in the text. Uh, because that's really the area that I live and breathe in, in apologetics, and, and really in archaeology and history, is in the Old Testament. And uh, I know a lot of guys have their specialties, you know, in, in apologetics. Some guys will focus on, you know, the age of the earth or, you know, the planets and the stars and astronomy and physics, things like that. That's all great. My area of interest is in prehistory and in the earliest uh, history of the Old Testament. So um, this surfaces the issue of chronology. Uh, there was a book written several years ago by uh, a professor at the University of Arizona named Dr. William Deaver. Um, and Dr. Deaver was a uh, fellow classmate of uh, the professor that mentored me uh, over in Mississippi State University, Dr. Joe Sager, Joe D. Sager. Uh, Dr. Sager and Dr. Deaver went to Harvard together and then excavated at a place called, called Kel Gezer in, uh, in Israel. And they came up with the Gezer uh, manual of excavation. So a lot of archaeologists today, they're doing excavation. They use the manual of how to actually do excavation that was uh, co-authored by Dr. Deaver and Dr. Sager and many uh, several other scholars. But anyway, Deaver said this, and, and the name of his book is, and it really the name of the book is a great name of the book. Uh, I don't agree with Dr. Deaver and some of his conclusions, but like like Hoffmeyer, Deaver, the name of the book is just really brilliant. What did the biblical writers know, and when did they know it? That's a great question. What did the biblical writers know, and when did they know it? Because a lot of people who don't believe in the biblical text will say, well, the biblical writers stole these ideas, or they made them up, or they wrote them later, uh, whatever the case may be. So um, to kind of review, we, we talked about last time we were together a few weeks, several weeks ago, actually, uh, a couple months ago, we were talking about the Exodus, and I uh, laid the case for the early date of the Exodus, uh, from several compelling lines of evidence that I believe are, are very uh, convincing, at least to me, and that is uh, chronology, internal evidence in the text itself, uh, 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, and then also uh, in the Jubilee cycles that are, are actually counted in the book of Leviticus, uh, when the priests began to count the year of Jubilee every seven years, and when you uh, count the Jubilee cycles as they came out of the Exodus, and you, you reverse the, the numbers back, it places the Exodus at around 1446 B.C., uh, the date of the Exodus. That's also uh, uh, in conjunction with the First Kings chapter 6, verse 1 date, uh, 480 years after, the laying, after Solomon laid the foundations of the temple in Jerusalem, uh, the Exodus occurred. So again, that date of the laying of the foundations of Solomon's temple happened at around 966 B.C., so when you sort of do the math, you come up with sort of a round number of around 1440, 1446, and that places the Exodus at about the 18th dynasty of Egypt uh, during sometime during the reign of a uh, two pharaohs that we we looked at, and uh, the, these two pharaohs keep coming up, but we, I, I believe there's one in particular I think was the pharaoh of the Exodus, and that's Amenhotep II. Now his father was a pharaoh by the name of Tutmosis III. We looked at that last the last time, and I'm not going to go over that. But what I want to do is I want to pick up the story uh, from where we left off and really sort of pick up the story where the Israelites left off. You know, they're, they've escaped out of Egypt. God miraculously delivered them out of Egypt. We looked at the evidence for this. Uh, in Egypt, we see that um, 
uh, during the reign of Amenhotep II. Uh, there's a lot of very interesting things that are going on during his reign. Uh, his father, Tutmos III, is considered the Napoleon of Egypt. He does 17 military campaigns into the Levant and into Syria, uh, gathering uh, forces for, his, uh, for, for Egypt. And then uh, he gives praise to Amun-Ra. This is sort of a pattern, and you would expect to see the son doing the same thing. So Amenhotep II begins to do the same thing that his father does. This is Tutmos III. But then something happens in the ninth year of his reign. All of a sudden, he does no more military campaigns. And uh, his, uh, his capital is actually not in Thebes to the south. His capital is in Memphis on the Nile, in the Nile, the north, northern part of Egypt, which is close to Goshen, which is where, if you remember, we placed at uh, a place in the, in the Egyptian delta called Tel El Daba, uh, or Avaris is where we call this. This is in the, in the Nile Delta area. This is where we believe the Israelites were located. And so uh, this is where Amenhotep II uh, kept his military forces and where he kept uh, his uh, perhaps chariots and other things like that. So archaeologically, that site goes blank in about 1446 B.C. So there's a whole lot going on there. So, so if that's the case, and we're, then as we, as we said at the beginning, the Exodus and Conquest stand or fall together. So we would expect to find uh, there, was a, there should be a 40-year gap, because obviously the Israelites went, into, went into, the, into the wilderness for 40 years. And then after that 40-year wandering, again, if the Exodus date is 1446, then we would expect to find some sort of conquest uh, in around, beginning in around 1400 uh, or there, uh, you know, give or take a few years B.C. So let's kind of review the travelogue for the ancient Israelites. Uh, so again, beginning with the 15th century Exodus date, and again, there are two dates that scholars look at for the Exodus. Uh, one is the 13th century date, and the other one is the 15th century date. This is the date that we are looking at, 1446. You add the 40-year wilderness wandering, and, uh, and then you uh, see they came... Again, just following the biblical text, they came to the uh, plains of Moab in Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. They came to a place called Abel Shatin, uh, which is uh, a site we know in Jordan called Tal al Hammam. And I've got several friends that are currently excavating there now in Jordan. It's a remarkable place. And by the way, as a little side note, uh, some of my friends, and I'll, we have some disagreement here, but some of my friends who are excavating here, I believe that this very well may be the site not only of Abel Shatim, but also maybe the site of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, in the Old Testament, uh, where Abraham you know, and Lot separated, and Lot went to Sodom and Gomorrah, that there is some evidence that there was some kind of meteorite impact near here, and that there was a fire and brimstone that destroyed the site. Um, again, that's, it's a chronological question, because all the, all the debates in archaeology really center on chronology, so I don't want to get into that. There's so many rabbit trails as, that's one of the toughest things about giving a talk on this, because there's, there's a thousand rabbit trails on each thing I say, go down, like, what about this? Because there's, everybody has opinions about it. As one of my colleagues says, uh, whenever you have three archaeologists in a room, you've got four or five or six opinions between the three. So we don't even, I don't even know what my opinion, no, I do. But uh, anyway, um, so they came to, and they crossed the Jordan at a place called Beth Abira, called the House of the Crossing. Very interestingly, this is where Jesus was baptized. It's the place of new beginnings, Beth Abira, the house of cross, house of the crossing. So isn't that cool how God does these things uh, geographically? He does something in the past, and then in the future he does something exactly there because he's trying to make a point. This is where a new beginning, the, the Israelites are crossing over the Jordan, and then they came and they camped at Gilgal, and then they came to Jericho, which we now know is a place called Tel El Sultan, uh, at about 1406 B.C. So uh, so let's talk about Jericho. Uh, we see this in Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. I, wanna, I don't want to read the whole thing, but I do want to bring out a couple of things here. At the very beginning there, you notice that um, verse 5, when you hear them, sound a long blast of the trumpets, he says, and have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. So... In the original Hebrew, the, literally the text says that the, uh, the wall of the city will collapse. That's how it's translated. But the actual Hebrew is the wall of the city will fall beneath itself. It will fall underneath itself. What, how does a wall fall underneath itself? I mean, the wall is above, and if the wall falls down, it's just down, right? Well, this is what 
archaeology really brings some really amazing illumination uh, to this. So the question is, did this actually happen? So before we get into some of the archaeological details of well, the conquest, let me just say this, that a lot of, uh, a lot of skeptics of the, the Bible will point out the fact that, uh, you know, we don't find any great conquests in Israel. Well, if you read, again, if you just follow the text, if you just read the biblical text, and you read the account of this happening, in the book of Joshua, which is a transition from the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, and the historical books, really there are only three major cities that the Bible says that the Israelites definitively destroyed. Three, just three. The rest of them were just really, really just a incursions and uh, little uh, battles in the hill country for the Israelites uh, beginning to spread out in the land. But there are only three cities that the Israelites definitively destroyed, and one of them is Jericho. You might know the next one is Ai, and the third one is Hatzor. There are only three. Jericho, I, and Hotzor. And we have, we have found, not me personally, but uh, in the past hundred years or so, archaeologists have discovered all three cities, and, uh, and all three cities are destroyed in exactly the manner that the Bible describes. The, the debate today that rages over these cities archaeologically is the dating. The dating is the, is the battle. That's where the battle takes place. And I believe that a, a, a very good scholarly case can be made uh, for the early dating of the destruction of these cities, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at uh, why we believe that these three cities were destroyed exactly in the manner the Bible describes them in the text. So first, let's talk about a tale. We may have talked about this uh, last time, but uh, just so you know, it's an Arabic word which literally means an artificial mound or a mound of dirt that contains ruins in it. And um, as you can see from this photograph here, it's a little illustration, uh, you know, we... It would be perfect if, it, when you go dig in Israel or wherever, that there's the, the, the layers are perfectly uniform. And that's never the case. They're always up and down, and sometimes you know you'll have an occupation here. Obviously, you see the lower, the lowest levels are obviously going to be the, the earliest levels, and then you've got them. And then sometimes they'll they'll build around a uh, an earlier occupational structure. So, and you have to figure all this out. It's like a g gigantic jigsaw puzzle. This is why. Uh, context is important in archaeology, discovering exactly where things are in relation to other things and uh, understanding the sequence of the deposition of the tale itself. One of the things that interests me from a professional standpoint is the actual uh, geology of the tale, the actual geological forces that actually, uh, when a tale gets laid down and it gets abandoned for centuries, uh, what types of uh, weathering and erosion and geological forces affect how under, our understanding of the tale. There's actually a whole science of this. Uh, Dr. Arlene Miller-Rosen uh, wrote a book called, uh, what's the title of the book? It's The Geoarchaeology of Tales. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a really, really good book, uh, an introduction to this whole process of the geology of tales itself. So that's something that, that uh, interests me. This is actually a photograph of uh, Jericho, Tel El Sultan. I believe, if my memory serves me correctly, that it was uh, first identified positively as Jericho uh, by William F. Albright. Uh, the place is, again, Tel El Sultan, and uh, it is one of the largest tells in Israel. And it is remarkable. You see this giant trench cut down the middle of it. You see the road to the, to the left of the site. Uh, there's actually modern Jericho, and this is ancient Jericho, obviously, and it's, it's in a tell. Uh, it was, it's the oldest occupied city in the world. Uh, at the very earliest layers of Jericho, archaeologists have discovered uh, these plastered skulls that date to the Neolithic. They date to the Stone Age. This is a very, very ancient site. So uh, whoever settled this area happened right after the, uh, after the Pleistocene. So like the, basically as the earth began to cool, uh, warm up and people began to uh, be more sedentary and stay in place, they came to Jericho. It's one of the oldest sites. In fact, uh, just recently in Israel, they found a huge Neolithic settlement in Israel, and it's, it's just now being excavated. So uh, there's a whole lot that we don't know. Uh, but just, what's that now? 10, yeah, it's about uh, around 10,000, 10 K, uh, th thereabouts, uh, 10,000 years ago. So it's one of the oldest occupied cities in the world. A uh, great battle still rages there today, and it's over the dating of it. In 1869, it was first studied by Charles Warren, who was a uh, British military guy who uh, surveyed a lot of different places. He, and this is the earliest 
uh, phase of archaeology and history. It's really not archaeology per se. He was a surveyor, but he was interested in biblical history. Uh, before him was an American scholar by the name of uh, Edward Robinson in the 1830s. Uh, he came to uh, Israel and from, from uh, actually began in, uh, where was it, in uh, Beirut, Lebanon with uh, Eli Smith, and he traveled throughout Israel, Eli, uh, Eli, uh, Eli, or Eli Smith and Edward Robinson, and they actually uh, wanted to record some of the place names of these ancient biblical sites, and they, uh, they were about 80% correct. And in 1838, I think it was, he wrote a book called Travels in Palestine in, uh, in Arabia and Patria in Egypt. So anyway, Charles Warren uh, first studied the site, identified it, uh, but it wasn't excavated until the Germans in 1913 by two German archaeologists named Selen and Watzinger. And uh, when Selen and Watzinger excavated the site, uh, obviously they didn't uncover everything because any, that's a lot, it's a, it's a massive amount of work uh, and it's a lot of things to untangle. But one of the things they did discover is they found on the outer in City 4, now obviously uh, as, you lay, as the depositions get layered down, uh, you'll have City 1, City 2, City 3, and so on. So City 1 would be the earliest. City 4, Jericho, uh, they found, Telling and Watziger found a casemate wall. And what a casemate wall is, it's basically uh, a wall that, that actually has got a double, uh, there's an outer wall and an inner wall, and in between them there's like rooms. You can actually, they use them for storage rooms, uh, to store grain or whatever the case may be. Sometimes they would actually live in these casemate walls and actually build uh, actually dwelling places along the wall. Now, what do you know about Jericho from exactly? Say it, say it out loud. Rahab. Rahab. And, and what was the significance of Rahab? Yes, but she lived in the wall, exactly. And that's how she let the spies out. That's exactly right. So already, right out of the gate, Jericho, we, again, we don't know the dating of this, but City 4 uh, does show a casemate wall. That, uh, that, day, that certainly uh, matches. And then in the 1930s, it was excavated about six years by John Garstang, an, a British archaeologist, who actually got help from the Oriental Institute here in Chicago. So John Garstang, along with the OI, excavated uh, there at Jericho between 1930 and 1936. And when Garstang excavated there, he continued along the casemate wall that uh, had been started by Selling and Watzinger and discovered that City 4 dated to 1406 B.C., so about the time of the conquest. Not only that, he discovered that there were two sections of the... There was actually... And I'll, i got a, another picture here in a moment that you'll see. But literally, there was an outer wall, casement wall, of Jericho, and then there was an inner... Uh, another fortress uh, another fortress of walls inside Jericho. So it was like double-walled city. There was like an outer wall, and there was an inner wall... And not only that, the walls actually, can, they were actually built on what's called a rampart or a, um, a, a casemate. Not a casemate, rather a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, it'll come to me in a second. Yeah, it's an incline, it's a glacé. Basically, it's, it's basically like a, a 15 or 10 or 15 feet of, of revetment, of backfill. It's a rocky uh, backfill, and then there's a wall built on top of it. So, so, it's, so you're standing, if you're an Israelite and you're at Jericho and you're standing there you're looking at the wall, first you come up with this, this base wall and then you look on top of it and there's a whole another 15 or 20 foot section of the wall on top of that. And then once you get over that, then you've got another inside of the wall. So the Bible says it was well fortified. That's exactly what we see in the archaeological record. It was very, very well fortified. And Garstang uh, excavated there and found that there were two sections two of the wall that had been breached that didn't look like that they were breached from without, they actually fell out, or actually outward toward the outer part of the city, and the bricks had actually formed a ramp along the basement of that casemate, uh, and actually formed a ramp right up into the city. So now, we'll read that passage again in, in verse 5, the walls fell beneath themselves. That's exactly what we find. And that, that's that remarkable? So it just shows us that the biblical writers were, were very accurate in, in their description of the destruction of Jericho. But it doesn't, there's more. You get more. Uh, Garstang also discovered that there was a burned and charred grain along with a pottery that had not been taken by whatever force it was or whatever thing it was that actually burned the city. The entire city was burned exactly as the Bible describes. Now, when you read the account in Joshua... When they destroyed Jericho, they were commanded very explicitly by God 
not to take anything from the site. And why was that? Does anybody know from a, from a biblical standpoint why that is the case or from a theological standpoint? There's actually a spiritual lesson that's very powerful, I think. Anybody know? While you're thinking, I'm going to get the call. May the Lord bless you. What's that? Yes, it's a great, and it's, a, yeah, Achan, that's exactly right. Achan actually, now they were commanded not to take anything from the site, but Achan, of course, did, and that's why as the second city they went to, they first, they should have easily defeated I, but they didn't because of Achan's sin. Uh, but, so the reason why he told him not, he said, you were to offer it to me as a burnt offering, a first fruit offering. Now, when you read back in Leviticus, back all the way back in the Exodus account, in Exodus and Leviticus, uh, whenever the Israelites were growing their crops and whatever, you know, let's just say, let's just use the example of a tomato. I mean, I don't know if they, they probably didn't have tomatoes now, I'm thinking the Near East. But let, let's just use that example because it's a good example. You, you'll, I think it will connect with you. Uh, let's just say that you're an Israelite and you lived back then and you lived after the Exodus and you're there planting your little garden next to your tent and you have this tomato vine and you, you, you tend it and you, you know, the Lord sends rain, He waters it. Well, a burnt offering is the first fruit. It's the very, that tomato that you spent months and months and months cultivating and tilling. And instead of taking that tomato yourself, you pick it off the vine and you give it to you, put it in a burnt, or you just completely destroy it. You give it to God. Well, why would you do that? Because it's, a, a, it's an act of faith recognizing that God is the one. It's an offering. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an act of worship. It's saying, God, I didn't do this. I didn't give the rain. I didn't produce it. You did this. This is your glory, your honor. So just in the same way, he told Joshua to offer up Jericho as a burnt offering, as a recognition that you're not the one who did this. I am the one who destroyed Jericho. Yes? And that's the carbon-14 dating? What's that? The carbon dating? Yes. The, the uh, burn remains uh, of Jericho? Yeah. Yes. Yes, they can. And they have. Absolutely have. Yes. So Here's the thing, though, yes, and that brings up a good question. We'll come to that in a moment when we talk about some objections about this interpretation, because, uh, but that's a great, really good question. There's something called uh, the Late Bronze Age uh, uh, Carbon-14 Offset. So there's some, there's some dates that in the Late Bronze Age are not, the radiocarbon dates are not quite as accurate for whatever reason. It's not just here, it's also in Egypt as well. And it's known about by many archaeologists. And they, in fact, there's papers being written on it today People trying to figure out why the radiocarbon dates don't quite match what we see in the archaeological record. So I think a lot of times we put a lot of stock in radiocarbon dating, C14 dating, and there's some good evidence for that. Uh, but you've got to be careful not to put all your eggs in the C14 basket because there's a whole lot more in archaeology than just uh, radiocarbon date. We, we also date by pottery as well. And pottery uh, will also give us a very firm date. Also, something called excuse me, historical synchronisms. And uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. So hold your thought on that. It's a great question, though. So Garsang excavated there, discovered this amazing evidence for the destruction of Jericho, exactly as the Bible describes it. And then in the late 1940s, early 50s, a British, another British archaeologist came along named Kathleen Kenyon. And Kenyon excavated there, and uh, she, states, she stated in, uh, before she went to excavate there that she wanted to go for whatever reason, she said, she wanted to go look at Jericho without the bias of the Bible. So uh, whether or not she had an ax to grind, I don't know. I, I can't do psychoanalysis, but certainly she was not uh, friendly to the biblical text or to biblical history. So uh, she, uh, and then Bryant Wood later, we'll talk about it here in a moment, but basically what she did was she redated City 4 of Jericho, basically saying it wasn't destroyed to the Israelites, it was destroyed about 100 to 200 years later by the Egyptians, and uh, it was not. So essentially, she raked off of the table the conquest of Jericho, which is why to this very day, many Near Eastern archaeologists do not believe that there was a historical conquest because they're following Kathleen Kenyon. The question is, who was right? Was, was, uh, was John Garstang correct, or was Kathleen Kenyon correct? Again, uh, there's a whole lot that's resting on this because really there's no other Jericho. If this is not, if there's no conquest here, it did not happen. I'm just telling you, there's no other place called Jericho. Nobody today uh, doubts that this is Jericho. It's definitely the site. So this is, I, I promise you, kind of looking down on the, uh, the rampart wall. That's what it's called, revetment wall. That's, I was trying to think of the name of it. 
revetment wall, then you've got the plastered rampart inside the city, then you have the upper wall there, and uh, you have a modern reservoir that's connected there. So it was a double-walled fortress, and uh, the uh, again, two sections of the wall. This was breached, and this was breached, and the wall fell beneath itself so that there was a ramp that went up into the city so the Israelites could go up into the city and destroy it. Uh, this is John Garstang, and I don't know if uh, this is the case today, but I think it's really cool that you wear white, you know, when you're doing an excavation. <laughs> but uh, I want to bring that back, you know, and digs. They're like, hey, guys, we should just start wearing white, you know, <laughs> outfits and pith helmets. <laughs> exactly. But uh, what's that? It would be cooler. That's exactly right. It sure would. What's that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It'd be much cooler. Uh, so let's talk about ceramic topology for a moment and why this is important. Um, this is something that's been developed over 100 years now, and I, I think many people who, who have a little bit of understanding of archaeology, sort of, they sort of understand this, but I don't think they fully grasp how important uh, uh, typology is, or ceramic typology. Um, so pottery styles change over time. This is something that we can see in the archaeological record, uh, and we use these stylistic changes to actually date the different layers of the tells. Now you say, well, how in the world, you know, can you, how in the world can you tell the subtle differences between this piece of pottery and that piece? Because they all look the same, and it's all just brown pottery. How 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 can you tell the difference? Well, people have been doing this, studying this for for over a hundred years. Uh, it was first recognized by really going all the way back to the German archaeologist uh, by the name of Heinrich Schliemann. He was digging in Troy, at Hisarlik, in Turkey, and discovered there was pottery there. Now you could actually uh, see the different sequential uh, differences in the pottery by the uh, layers. Uh, an, another guy who visited there was uh, Flinders Petrie, who was a British archaeologist, and he brought this understanding to Israel at a place called Tel El Hesi in Israel and began to utilize the first scientific use of pottery for actually dating the stratigraphy of a tell. So I have my phone here. And uh, I don't know, how many of you have an iPhone? Raise your hand. I have an iPhone. Raise your, just, uh, yeah, about half in here have an iPhone. And um, what version do you have, Jeff? Do you have the 11? Ooh, big money Jeff. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I have the 7. Uh, but no, you, but if you, seriously though, guys, if you really, if you like, you wonder how in the world, it, it all looks the same. Well, here's the thing. We're familiar with an iPhone, and there's they all look the same. When you look at them, you line them up. But if you really look close, oh, this has got this little thing here. This little speaker looks different. The phone, little camera looks different. You can tell the difference between a 7 and a 10 and a whatever. Although they all look alike, you can know the subtle differences in an iPhone. Does that make sense? So archaeologists have no problem finding the stylistic differences in this pottery. And so these stylistic changes, like a Coke bottle styles change over time, uh, phone designs change over time, pottery styles change over time. We see these stylistic changes, and that's how we date sites. And, and it's very accurate, in fact, uh, so much so that uh, it's, uh, it's where a lot of the debate happens today is really over the dating of the pottery. So these changes can help archaeologists date the layers in a tell. So let, we'll come back to that in a moment. So this is sort of an artist picture of what it may have looked like uh, of the outer wall, see the casemate. This is where the uh, Rahab would have lived. Maybe the window. There was also outward-facing windows, which, when you read the biblical account, when Joshua, uh, you know, the spies of Israel came into Jericho, uh, they were let out down through the window, and they were told to spare. So some of the houses were actually not destroyed. Which also, I mean, in every little detail, the archaeology actually backs up. When Garstang excavated City Four. All these details really came out that the, that the biblical text was actually absolutely correct. So basically, the, the pottery that's, uh, that was excavated by Garstang, there was a certain kind of pottery. We, let's go back to the, to the different stylistic changes. Well, again, certain styles of pottery actually date certain particular layers at, that, at, that time, at a particular time. So, for instance, in the Iron Age, we know that there's X amount of pottery, and it's regional too. So in, in, in like in Israel... We know that this particular style of pottery will date. If you find X pottery at this layer, it's going to date is this layer. So the particular kind of pottery we're talking about here at Jericho is something called Cypriot bichrome pottery. Cypriot, it's come from Cyprus. And what was happening is uh, it was locally made by the Canaanite culture, 
but it was also imported. So there are two basic kinds of Cypriot pottery that you find in Israel, locally made and imported. So as you can guess, if you are, let's give me, let me give you an example here. If you're going to buy pottery, if you're going to buy uh, this really fine bone china from London and you have it shipped in, you think it's going to be more expensive? Yes, obviously. But if you, if you, buy, if you go to Target, Target, and you buy, and, you, and it looks exactly like the kind of, it's not quite, it's not a cheaper version of the one in London that your, your wife wants for her, her dining room table. Well, in the same way, in Jericho, they're, lo- they're making locally made Cypriot pottery. And here's the thing, guys. Whenever you find locally made Cypriot pottery, it dates to the, uh, to the late bronze, to the time of the conquest. So when Garstang excavated at Jericho, the sections that he excavated, he found Cypriot, locally made Cypriot ware in profusion, in great, a great abundance. But uh, Kathleen Kenyon excavated... She was excavating in a, in a wealthier area. She didn't find it, so she redates. She didn't take into account Garstang's Cypriot pottery, but then it's found elsewhere in proliferation. Again, uh, in great proliferation. So there's been a lot of um, uh, debate about whether or not Kathleen Kenyon was trying to sort of cut, undercut the biblical text. I don't know. Again, we can't do psychoanalysis, but one thing is for sure, and that is she does ignore the great amount of Cypriot pottery that was found at Jericho, uh, and so much so that Dr. Bryant Wood, who is an archaeologist with the Associates of Biblical Research, has written uh, many articles on this, and I can give you, an, if you want a scholarly article on it, I can give you one uh, in email. I think uh, 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 maybe Bob has got you, all you guys' email, and I will I'll forward you that uh, article if you'd like to see it. But basically, it's Dr. Bryant Wood is, is contesting uh, the interpretation of Kathleen Kenyon's redating of Jericho, and his basically his idea is that Kathleen Kenyon was incorrect uh, and, and uh, presumptuous in her reanalysis of Jericho, and that John Garstang was actually correct that the original dating of City Four is 1406 BC, and that this in fact is the conquest of Jericho. Does that make sense? Any questions so far about Jericho? <laughs> we'll get this rebooted. So. Oh, the offset, yes. So uh, this is also discovered at Tel Aldaba. I was mentioning earlier. So in, uh, Tel Aldaba is in the Nile Delta, and uh, it was, it's been excavated for over 30 years by an Austrian archaeologist by the name of Manfred B. Tack. And uh, Dr. B. Tack is a great archaeologist. He's a German-speaking Austrian guy, really sharp, very meticulous. And uh, so in Tel Aldaba, uh, they've done some radiocarbon dates to some of the organic remains. And uh, so they've done 30 years of archaeological, so looking, comparing the pottery, comparing all the different things. And so they've got a really good picture of what they know historically based on scarabs and based on there's any number of cross-references that they can really cross over and get a really good firm date of Tel Odaba. Then when they did the radiocarbon dates, they were not right. They were about 200 years off, actually. And they're like, these cannot be right. We know there was even when you account for the uh, what do you call it, the, the fluctuation or the um, uh, what's the word, the scientific word. There's a, a range, a range. Yeah, whenever you have the range, whenever you can, even in accounting for the range, there's a 200 year offset. And so he published this. What's it? I don't know exactly if it's earlier or later, but uh, in any case. Uh, He's, been, he's talked about this, and this is actually now being t- discussed by archaeologists why this is the case. They don't know what any number of things could affect it. Volcanism affects it. Uh, meteorites affect it. All kinds of things. Uh, they don't know. In the Near East, in, the, in, in, in Egypt, and also at Jericho. There's a 200-year also at Jericho. Here's the thing is that, here's the problem, is that nothing in the ancient Near East uh, has a date stamped on it. <laughs> this is yeah, but, right. But um, my point is, I'm getting to something else, and that is that we what we would like to have. Everybody wants certainty, but I'm just telling. I'm just telling you guys. Some of you physics guys, some of you engineers, you ain't gonna get certainty in archaeology. You're just not gonna get it. And I'm sorry to burst your bubble. You're just not gonna get absolute 100% certainty. You're gonna get ranges. You're gonna get. You're gonna get. Uh, you're gonna get these real, you know, approximations. So that's not, that's not a saying. It's a bad question. It's a great question. But what we do have, the closest thing that we can get to certainty in archaeology is what we call historical synchronisms. And this is when we have uh, one event, like an astronomical event, that's recorded in a, in a historical inscription or a text, 
in which we can then use Kepler's laws of planetary motion to look at an exact calendar date of when this happened. One example would be the Ebers papyrus that happens. It, talk, it talks about the heliacal rising of the Sothic dog star over Thebes. So you can't get more specific than that. This is in a text, in a papyrus. So when you look at Thebes, and you, you know kind of approximately when it happened, you can then look at when the Sothic dog star rose up. And, and the, so when that date, you can get a really firm date. Another date you have is a very firm date in the historical record is the uh, Assyrian destruction of uh, Lachish and besiegement of J uh, Jerusalem in about 701 B.C. We have this in the Assyrian records, and we also have it in the uh, Israeli uh, archaeology as well. At, uh, at the place called uh, uh, Tel Lachish and also in Israel. And so there are any number of ways that we can do this. And so historical synchronism is really what we want to try to get. And so uh, this, this would be like... Um, historical artifacts that we find in association with the pottery. So pottery will give you a, a pretty good approximation of the date of a particular layer. But then when we find, for instance, a scarab, and we know the dates of these pharaohs who reign, and, and the scarabs are very... In fact, scarabs even themselves are being used today by archaeologists to date as a diagnostic tool to date uh, sites because uh, the uh, particular artistic styles and the way that they were actually designed uh, we can actually trace these historically, and there's people who are experts in scarab uh, iconography, and uh, so so we know that let's say Tutmos the Third used a sphinx and a scarab, and so when you find a Tutmos the Third sphinx scarab at a particular layer, it's gonna, and you find the pottery that dates that layer, it's gonna. So for instance, I haven't gotten to it yet, but uh, at Kermit El Makhater at I, the second city, we're gonna talk about in a second. Uh, there is a, a Tutmos the Third scarab found in the Late Bronze Age at Kerb el Makater. So it's a pretty firm date. It's a bit like dating a house based on the fact that they have a harvest garden avocado planted. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right, so let's kind of review uh, the discoveries of Jericho. Uh, heavily fortified at the time of the conquest, the piles of brick from the base of the collapsed city wall verifies uh, Joshua 6.20, the, fall fell, uh, the wall fell beneath itself. The earthen embankment required Israel to go up into the city. Uh, houses were built into the lower city wall and did not collapse, verifying uh, Rahab's house location. Uh, a layer of ash three feet thick was burned. Timbers and debris indicates the Israelites burned the entire city. But there's more. It kind of sort of also answers your issue as well, and that is that uh, it, is, it occurred at the end of the 15th century, exact time of the conquest, based, again, on this internal consistency of the text. 1 Kings 6, 1, Judges 11, 26, 1 Chronicles 6. And then also, the large amphora jars full of charred grain actually indicates that there was a large amount of grain uh, at Jericho, which also indicates uh, the harvest had just been taken in. So this lets you know exactly when this happened, in the fall of the year, very interestingly. It's what the... It's also interesting that it wasn't taken away with food. That's right. That's exactly right. Because normally... Uh, if you were an invading army, you're going to take, especially stuff like this, food, you're going to take it off. That's part of the spoils of war. The siege was short, lasting seven days. The Israelites did not plunder the city, Joshua 6, 18, exactly as the Bible says. So in, in great detail, the biblical text is actually correct in what it says. This is a cross-section of Kathleen Canyon. Just so you see, this is not just something we're making up. This is the backfill of the revetment wall. That's the revetment wall there. This is the bricks that formed the ramp right up into the city, and just remarkable. So when, so when, literally the, fall, the wall fell, it was standing up like that, and it fell down, and all these bricks were just a ramp right up into the city. So um, quite remarkable when you see all the evidence put together. Uh, there's Kathleen Kenyon, and she's digging with white as well. So I think that's the thing we need to bring back in archaeology is wearing white clothes. <laughs> but uh, this is the Cypriot pottery I mentioned. Uh, these are the diagnostic, uh, what, we're look, what we look for in archaeology is we look for diagnostic pottery, and uh, we look for uh, bases, rims, and handles. And these are, would be body sherds, and so we know we have a lot of these, and if we, if we found a lot together, we can actually reconstruct these. But this is a typical indicator of late Bronze Age one in Israel, whenever you find Cypriot pottery. So um, this is very important. And that, th again, this is found in great proliferation at Jericho. Remember there are two, two different kinds? Remember what they were? There's locally made and imported. 
So imported means it's expensive. Locally made means it is actually uh, cheap. That's right, Target. <laughs> so uh, according, also there's one other thing too that really, really to me seals the deal for Jericho being destroyed in the late Bronze Age. According to Judges chapter 3, a Moabite king named Eglon built a palace right directly on the ruins of Jericho. Uh, he extracted tribute from the Israelites for 18 years. In the 1930s, Garstang discovered a middle building, get this guys, uh, between an Iron Age structures in the 15th century uh, BC city matching the biblical description exactly. So the building dates to the second half of the 14th century the time of Eglon's oppression. This is the period of the Judges. So basically, Jericho's destroyed. It, it's a ruin heap. And then Eglon, during the Judges period, builds a palace on the ruins of Jericho and extracts tribute. Well, guess what they found? That exact palace. Isn't that, isn't that cool? So the plan of the building is similar to other palaces in the period and fits the description given in the Bible. It was isolated. It was an isolated structure, exactly as the Bible states it was, and uh, it was a uh, occupied by a wealthy, uh, uh, wealthy resident by the imported Cypriot pottery. So again, the imported pottery indicates wealth, and there is the actual uh, middle building excavated by John Garstein. So, really, really cool. So all the evidence together, again. When you look at the cumulative case, and again, I don't take all these in isolation. I'm thinking about all of it together as a broad thing. We're talking, just think about the 15th century Exodus date. Everything fits together. The uh, Exodus from, uh, Israel, from Egypt fits. The conquest begins to fit together. You begin to see a conquest, a pattern, you know, like, the, like the documentary, patterns of evidence. There's now patterns of evidence that there really was an Exodus and there really was a conquest in the early date, uh, dating period. So this is, uh, this is some of the conclusions from Dr. Bryant Wood uh, from an art the article he wrote that Kenyon was incorrect in her analysis. Uh, the evidence seems to converge that City 4 was destroyed 1400 BC, not in 1550, as Kenyon maintained. According to similar pottery discovered at other locations, the dating of destruction uh, dates to around 1401 to 1406, 40 years after the wilderness wandering, again, matching the biblical chronology which places a good archaeological dating reference to the Exodus at 1446. So you can go either way. You can look for the evidence for the conquest and see, okay, if there's a conquest here, then where do these people come from? And, uh, and so you do the clock back, and you can see that they very likely came from Egypt uh, because of the uh, presence of scarabs at some of these sites. So this is a summary of the uh, archaeological evidence for the destruction of Jericho in the late Bronze Age. Now, one of the things that Ke Kathleen Kenyon said is that the walls, well, the walls were built in the middle of Bronze Age, and she may be right about that. But does it matter when they were built? What matters is when they fell. They could have been built during the middle Bronze Age, but they fell in the late Bronze Age. That's the important thing. So you can have an old building that's built in the 1800s. The question is, when did it fall? Did it fall in 2000? Did it fall in 1800s? So, so that's not a problem. Still, it's not a problem. Um, carbonized grain, burned ruins, 18th Dynasty scarabs, uh, ceramic state to the Light Bronze Age, Cypriot bichrome pottery, and then uh, also I mentioned this, uh, the C14 dates are off by a couple hundred years. Yes? Is the bichrome a reference to the blaze on it? Yes, the two colors. So two colors. So basically kind of a black and white color. And there's sort of these zoomorphic uh, animal figures like deer, you know, antelope kind of things. There's just some some uh, figures on, that are painted on there. So that has to do with the style. That's a good question. All right. Any questions on Jericho? Yes. Okay. 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 Sure. There. Very good. Thank you. So uh, let's talk about this. And yeah, this will be a good kind of this. I can kind of work through this. This is a site that I have actually excavated myself personally uh, at Kerbet El Makader. Uh, Kerbet, uh, we talked about two, two different kinds of archaeological ruins in, in the Levant. One is called the Tell, which is an artificial mound. And the other kind of ruin, or other kind of ruin, is called a curbet, or ruin. It's literally what it means, is ruin. It just, it's basically like the archaeological uh, features are just on the surface. They're sort of just scattered along the surface. So that's a curbet el Makader is uh, where we believe the site of Ai is. In 2014, I uh, was able to bless to be there to take part in the excavation. Uh, I mentioned him earlier, Dr. Bryant Wood. Uh, 
just a little bit of a background on I. Let me just say this because of time. Um, for years, there archaeologists who believe in the biblical text, Old Testament scholars, have been perplexed about the location of I. And there were about two or three really good candidates for I uh, in, the, in, in the archaeological record. Uh, one is called Kerbet Nissa. The other one is called Et Tel. And Et, E-T, Tel, Et Tel is the name of the site. Uh, it was believed that that was the very likely place of the, uh, of, of the actual site of I. But for years, archaeology have been excavating at Et Tel. And guess what? In late Bronze Age, there's no conquest. In fact, there's nobody even living there. So the site has to be occupied. So either that's not I or the conquest didn't happen. So Dr. Bryant Wood uh, began to look at the geography of the area and found that there are a number of sites in the same area that could be really good candidates for the biblical site of I. And so years ago, he just scoured through the Old Testament, Joshua, book of Joshua, 7 and 8, and he began to list geography, geographical references, archaeological references, historical references, and came up with 12 specific things that if you're going to find the site of I, if it does exist, it's got to be here, it's got to do this, it's got to do this, and here they are. Here are the 12 uh, different things for identifying the site of I. Archaeological requirements for I, there are about 12 of them. Obviously, it must be occupied at the, at the time of the conquest, at the late 15th century or the late Bronze Age. It has to be fortified at the time of the conquest. Uh, it has to have a gate on the north side of the site, Joshua chapter 8, verse 11. Uh, it has to be destroyed by fire, just like, the, just like Jericho was destroyed by fire. I has also has to be destroyed by fire as well. And then uh, it has, let me just go back up, go back. It has to be left in ruins uh, after... I'm really not liking this thing. Okay, so here, let me go back. Normally I like Max, but this one's really getting on my nerves now. All right, it has to be left in ruins after 1400 B.C. So these, that's five, and then we have the next few. The geographical requirements it has to be adjacent to Beth Avon. It has to be east of Bethel. There must be an ambush site uh, between Bethel and I, a militarily significant hill north of I, so basically, it's a classic ambush. When you read in the account of Joshua, uh, what he did was, uh, you read the account, Joshua 7 and 8, Joshua got on his horse, he got a spear, and he placed himself and part of his army on a hill right out of the front gate. So if this is the front gate of Ai, and uh, you open the gate, there should be a hill north that they could just see, or being on a tower, being on a lookout tower, they could see Jer jo Joshua. So he stood on this hill, waved his basically, hey, come get me, you know. And so they opened up the gates. The army fled out of the city, left the gates wide open. And his, what he did was he got another part of his army to the back of it, down in the valley. And, the, and as the gates were open, they left the gate door wide open. The second part of the army came into the city and burned it and destroyed it, exactly as it says. So it's a classic ambush. So... All this has to be wherever site, whatever site you find that has that, that's I. And Kermit el Makader fits every single one of these parameters exactly. Uh, a shallow valley north of I as well. It also has to be smaller than Gibeon. So uh, there's a whole lot more. In the, in also the vicinity of Bethel. So let's go over the evaluation. Et Tel met the one we talked about earlier, that site that had been excavated for 30 years. Uh, met three, possibly four, of the 12 biblical, archaeological, and geographical requirements for I. Uh, the second site is a site called Kerbet Nissa. It met five of the 12 possible archaeological requirements, and Kerbet el Makader met all 12 biblical and archaeological requirements. So it matched exactly as we read in the text itself. So uh, this is an, a map. It's a little difficult to read there, but let me just show you how close all these are. That's Kerbet Nissa. That's Kerbet el Makader, and that's Et Tel. And that's Beitin, or Bethel, or this could be Bethel Elbira. So there's some debate as to whether or not Beitin or Elbira. By the way, this is in the modern city of Nab or, or, uh, Ramallah, which is in the West Bank. 
This is actually the uh, home of Yasser Arafat, who's now buried there. Uh, it's the home of the PLO. So this is contested territory right here, even to this very day. Kerbet el Makader is located nine miles north of Jerusalem in the West Bank, right on Ridge. And uh, I've got some amazing pictures. So this is actually uh, a security road. You can see Ramallah over here. Our bus parked right here. This is a Jewish settlement. We walked up this little sidewalk here, crossed over the highway, and Jericho, or I, is actually right across uh, the street in this, on the other side. So this in the morning, uh, as we began the excavation, uh, starts at about 5.30 a.m. So you get up at 4.30, and you're at the site by about 5.30, 5.45. You guys ready to go? <laughs> and uh, these are actually, uh, these are actually not from anything particular. This is actually de debris from just uh, removing uh, debris from the site to get it ready for excavation. This is day one of, uh, of the, our season beginning in 2014 of excavating at Kerbet What's that? That was in May of the year. It was actually chilly in the morning, and it got pretty warm by about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, 80s, yeah, but real dry. The, the climate of Israel is about like Southern California, so... If you think of like Sonoma Valley, like with a wine country, it's pretty nice. But you, there's chilly days, and it gets really hot and dry, so it's semi-arid is the climate there. So this is actually uh, looking down at Kerbet el -Makader. Guess what? This is the Late Bronze Age Canaanite Fortress. Uh, the little black parts there, this, is the, this was made in 2000, so this actually, uh, there's a better map later. I'm going to wrap this up here in a moment. But this is the gate pointing north. And uh, this is a, a single-chambered gate, so basically they have these little chambers right here. This is the late, late Bronze Age wall. I actually exca excavated here along the Late Bronze Age wall in square Q10, I think it was. Uh, our other t part of our team uh, was excavating. There's actually a Hellenistic Jewish city village that was built in the ruins of Ai that they were excavating as well that uh, Dr. Stripling believes actually may be the ancient city of Ephraim mentioned in the New Testament. No way to know for sure, but we know it is definitely a Jewish site for sure because of the presence of mikvot, which are these ritual baths that we found dug in the ground there at Kerbet el Makader. So that's, this is right here. This, this right here is the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. So that's literally when you're standing on top of the hill, that's the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. This is the Jewish settlement. This little intersection right here, there's a little bus stop right here. I think some uh, Jewish settlers were, were killed there. Uh, a few years or so ago, uh, this is contested territory. This is in the West Bank. So uh, we had Palestinians excavating with us at the site as well as Israelis. So it was kind of an intense situation to be there. I did, never got the uh, impression that the Palestinians disliked me being there or us being there. What I, what I got, the, the, the view that I got, that they, they didn't want the Israelis there, the Jews there. Uh, they wanted just to be left alone. So it's, it's still very... Uh, to this day, very contested. This to the other side of the site, there's the Arab village of Deir Dibwan, and they get money from all kinds of governments to build these settlements. They build these huge houses there in, uh, in the area. It is still, the area is still a ruin to this day, and it is a uh, sheep pasture, basically, goats. And we're excavating, and there's goats right there, like, you know, right there, right inside. <laughs> so uh, that's one of the guys that, uh, Palestinians that uh, live in the area. Uh, his name is Ahmed, uh, and he excavated with us. Really nice guy. Loved coffee. I'm a big coffee snob, so he and I got along great. And uh, so it was a really amazing site uh, at Kerbin el What I want to show you here, I'm going to kind of go through this. Let me go back here. So right here, what I'm going to show you next is what this looks like today. This is actually looking down at the site north. Remember, the gate has to point north. And so this next picture right here, is uh, me standing in the section of the gate. So I kind of outline it so you see. So you see the outline, the square, the base of it. And that's how wide the wall would have been. And uh, the other side would have been, had basically been taken down because this is, this is the Hellenistic city that's been excavated as well. So the gate points north. And when you read in the, Bible, the Bible's account of when the Israelites, when Joshua defeated the king of Ai, it says that he did what? you remember what he did with the king of Ai? Yes, and also what else? He buried him in the gate of Ai. So uh, we were talking about 
you know, digging down there to see if we could find the skeleton of the King of Ai. We don't, I don't think he, I don't think Scott did that, but who knows? I mean, I don't know if it's been taken or, you know, if it even still exists anymore. But it, it may be. Yeah, it depends on uh, how what what erosion got got to it. Yeah, but uh, in any case, uh, it's all there. This is the uh, picture of the excavation team uh, excavating in the late bronze or the uh, Hellenistic city. This is uh, beginning of the excavation. That's the Dr. Gary Byers. And this is us uh, with the surveyors. And the very first thing we do is, of course, we uh, square off the site. And this is a really good solid stone here. And we set a benchmark and we do a, a, an elevation measurement. And we get a Sharpie and we write the measurement on that stone so that then whatever artifact we find in this square, we can know, we can measure it from that square exactly, uh, uh, from sea level exactly where it is in a three-dimensional context. So that's kind of day one what we do. I'm going to move this very quickly. Uh, as we begin to excavate down, we're getting down. What we want to do is we want to get down to bedrock, go down to the lowest occupational layer, and as we go down, we're recording. We'll put anything we find. Uh, we'll measure it. We'll put it in a bucket. The bucket has a tag on it, and, and then we go. We wash it at the end of the day, and then we have a pottery reading. It's a lot of fun, and you can join us next year at Shiloh to do this. So this is what it looks like. Sometimes you find little critters uh, in, in the dirt. Yeah, that's pretty big, good size. It's probably about that. Yeah, it's, it would it's yeah, it would it would probably sting. <laughs> I would want to get stung by it. Are they good to eat? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it might. You, you never know. Yeah, tastes like chicken. <laughs> this is in the. Uh, this is actually some of the students in the. Uh, this is the Hellenistic uh, uh, city. And it very interestingly, now this is not what we're talking, we're not talking about here necessarily about the, uh, about the Jewish uh, first century uh, uh, site, but interestingly, there was an olive press found in association with, association with the site, and there was a hidden chamber in the olive press underground that back in, uh, I want to say in the fairly early 2000s, 2009 I think it was, I'm not positive on the date, but around that time frame, one of my friends, uh, I, think, I don't know if it was Abigail or I think it was maybe Abigail Levitt, who discovered uh, seven skeletons in this uh, actual hidden chamber. And you, to get to it, you literally have to get on your elbows and crawl into it and make a left turn, and then it kind of opens up. But they had bronze uh, Roman arrowheads. This is during the time of the Roman uh, siegement of Israel in 70 AD when the Jewish revolt. And so we believe that these were Jewish... Uh, and individuals that were killed during the revolt in 70 AD. So this is uh, in that same sort of occupational time frame. Uh, there's the pottery after it's been washed, and then we do the pottery. That's Dr. Bryant Wood mentioned earlier, and that's Gary Byers, and uh, th they're doing the pottery reading uh, just like you uh, read any other type of text. Uh, Archaeology uh, involve uh, interpretation as well, so you do the pottery reading, and uh, that's... Uh, Perez, who is one of the top Israeli uh, archaeologists uh, in Israel, doing you know, pottery reading as well. Scott Stripling is now the dig director of Shiloh, and uh, we're going to be joining them next year, Epic Archaeology, and some of you may be joining us, Brad, uh, hint, hint, and uh, he may be he coming with us next year, but we're going to be digging at Shiloh, uh, Tel Shiloh in Israel, which is the next step after the conquest of Jericho, Ai, and Hatzor, then they go to Shiloh and they, uh, they basically you know, divide up the land and they begin to occupy and it goes into the judges period. But we believe that there is evidence of the tabernacle at Shiloh and there's some really cool archaeology that's coming out of the ground already on that. So uh, there's any number of jobs that you can do at a site. You don't have to be in the ground digging. If you want to, you can. Uh, you can also uh, work in data entry. We have these artifacts that we have labels and different things and this is... Uh, Abigail uh, sharing with some of, the, some of the college girls actually how to enter this into the database. Uh, you're there in the shade, in the tent, you know. It's a very nice breeze blowing, so it's any number of things you can do at the site. This is really cool. This, was, this is actually Roman glass, and I was trying to take a picture. You could actually see the, uh, the beautiful uh, sheen of the glass. Sometimes they would put like uh, gold and silver in the glass, and just an amazing uh, color of it. Glass beads as well. Uh, there's the one of the mikvot that was dug in the ground. This is the olive press. This is a cistern. Looking into the cistern, 
and this is actual the place where the skeletons were found. And it's kind of, I mean, I took, as best I could, I took a picture with my camera and my phone, and that's me climbing out of it. So if you're claustrophobic, then you probably would not <laughs> want to crawl in there. Uh, you couldn't turn around You could not, well, once you got in it, you could turn it, but once you're in it, I am backing out. I am. I could not, yeah, I could not go head for it first. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty cramped. So they found the Byzantine church there uh, at Art Kerbet El Makader, and we believe that this this is the last column that was there. It was uh, they were uh, I think I think there were 20 columns total, and they were all taken uh, illegally or legally, depends on how you look at it, uh, by the Palestinians and taken to the village. Uh, this thing is not light either, so they must have used some type of heavy equipment to get it out of the ground. Uh, but they took it down in the village. But it dates to the uh, Byzantine period. And these are, uh, these are tessera or mosaic tiles, so the mosaic floor. Let me give you a real quick summary here of significant discoveries at I. One is the scarab from the 18th dynasty of Egypt, Tutmos III, or Amenhotep II, based on the iconography. So this is basically a lion with a sphinx, a head of a sphinx. And this is based on uh, an archaeologist that's working in Israel that knows the iconography of these scarabs. So the, the fact is that this was found in the destruction layer, in the 1400 uh, BC destruction layer of I, in association with it. And it was found in a sealed locus. In, 20, in 2013, Christianity Today named this, the Makata Scarab as one of the top 10 archaeological discoveries of 2013. So what this means is this is a really good definitive way to date the conquest of I. Pretty, pretty remarkable. Yes. Egyptians, why would a scarab from Egypt be there? Great question. Yeah, it's a great question. Well, <laughs> you tell me, based on what we've just been talking about. Could it be Mahoney talking about that? I mean, on his timeline? Yes, well. It could be Freddie, it could be that, he, that he, um, he's an Israelite who brought it with Bingo. Him. Could be the Israelites yeah. brought it with them. They brought back all kinds of things from Egypt. Yeah. And these things. Even though it, it looks like this now, they usually were covered in gold. Oh, okay. And uh, it may have fell out of a pocket of somebody, but it's in a sealed locus, which means it came, somebody that was in Egypt came there and it fell out of their pocket. So it's either Egyptians, and there's no evidence that the Egyptians were there, because this is, this is during the reign of, of Amenhotep II. And he didn't do any more military campaigns in, the, in Israel. So somebody that came from Egypt who had a scarab in their pocket from the reign of Tutmose III or Amenhotep II fell out of their pocket in the destruction of I. So well, pretty knowing that it was once covered with gold makes sense that it would be there. Yes. <laughs> Possibility that someone like a host someone could play it. So. There's a possibility, yes, but but this was found in a sealed locus. And, and what I mean is, is that uh, whenever you have a sealed locus, well not I, I don't mean loc I'm a s I have bad southern accent. So it's locus, L O C U S, not locust. So locus is basically, let's say you've got a corner of a building and you've got the walls that are connected in a corner wall and we know that this layer, anything you find, we found all kinds of pottery found on top of it and then we dig underneath it, it's sealed, means it can't, nothing could have, you can't have planted that. It fell there in situ 3,400 years ago. Whoever dropped this, it was there 3,000 years ago. So I, thought, I hope that makes sense. Um, No, but they could have melted it off. Yeah, absolutely. Gold was a very precious commodity. And so you, you, you whoever lost it could have already removed the gold. Very likely, yes. Possibly. There's any number of things. There's no way to know. Yeah, for sure. So that's kind of a picture of what scarabs look like. Uh, another really important thing there. Um, also, a bronze arrowhead and a sling stone was discovered in the Canaanite wall, indicating this military. In addition to that, there was an infant jar burial which indicates the presence of women and children at the site, based on what the biblical text says as well. So, um, and there's the bones from the infant. And this is Shiloh. This is, uh, this is back in 2014. It's now been excavated. Uh, also uh, discovered at Shiloh just last year was a ceramic pomegranate uh, discovered by Tim Lopez for, with ABR and stratum 3, locus 7. It dates to the time of when we believe the tabernacle was actually there.